Excuse me, little dog. Alright, guys. Alright, it is another frost on the pumpkin kind of evening here. In the collapse of everything here, uh, moving closer towards Halloween. So that would be, where are we up to? We are up to Friday, October 18th, 2024, in the fall of 2024. So we know what Friday means. Uh, well, it means a lot of things, but what it means around here, it is time for our weekly Ain't Gonna Happen Roundup rant, where I simply slog through, you know, the mainstream media, the alternative media, and medium.com, and all these other places looking for more and more, well, easier and easier to find examples of all the ways it ain't going to happen. Uh, you know, saving this, this planet, turning the freight train around, uh, keeping the window of opportunity open for a, uh, another, what, of course, the window of opportunity slammed shut 50 years ago, and the canary in the coal mine slammed into it and died of a head injury years ago, uh, but we all know what we're talking about, so let's, uh, let's look at a few examples of things that are not going to happen to save the planet and our fellow earthlings. And I've already got a tick on this dog, on this tick infested hound. Uh, but I gotta pet my computer here, so I'm gonna let the dog go put ticks all over my bed. Good God. Okay, you little tick hound. Uh, you know, so we don't worry, we will have plenty of uh, ain't gonna happens coming out of, what is it, COP29 coming up here in the new, near future. Did you notice I picked up my computer on a Friday and everything that I've done here did not disappear? Imagine that. Uh, but uh, while all eyes are turned to COP29, about two or three pairs of eyes are going to be uh, turned towards its kid sister. Uh, this latest unadulterated horseshit biodiversity global summit uh, coming up, I think. Is it coming up in Colombia here shortly? So this is COP16. COP16. So let's get a sneak preview of how COP16 is going to go, you know, to save our fellow earthlings. <coughs> is my drink already empty? Alright, we're going to go over to the Guardian, many versions of this story. But here's how we are now. About 80%. 80% of countries fail to submit plans to preserve nature ahead of global summit. Countries promise to save 30% of land and sea for nature, otherwise known as saving 70% of land and sea for humans, but as the deadline approaches, only 24 have followed through with a plan. Yes. More than 80% of countries have failed to submit plans to meet a UN agreement to halt the destruction of Earth's ecosystems. A new analysis is found nearly two years ago. The world struck a once-in-a-decade deal in Montreal, Canada that included targets to protect 30% of land and sea for nature, 
to protect 70% of land and sea for humans, to reform billions of dollars on environmentally harmful subsidies and slash pesticide usage, countries committed to submit their plans for meeting the agreement before the Biodiversity COP16 in Cali, Colombia, which begins this month. But only 25 countries have done so. Well, it was 24, and now it's 25. The other 170 countries have failed to meet the deadline. The world has never yet met one single target in the history of UN biodiversity agreements, and there had been a major push to make sure this decade would be different. Yes. Analysis by Carbon Brief and The Guardian shows that some of the most important ecosystems on the planet are not covered by national biodiversity strategies and action plans. Do you think so? Only five of the 17 mega diverse countries, home to about 70% of the world's biodiversity, produced action plans. That would be Australia, China, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Mexico. Suriname, you know, about the size of your little fingernail. Suriname was the only Amazon rainforest nation to submit a plan and not one Congo Basin nation had produced a plan by the deadline. Canada, Italy, France, and Japan were the only G7 nations to meet the deadline. Uh, Crystal Davis, Global Director for the Food, Land, and Water Program at the World Resources Institute said, quote, nature is facing a crisis largely driven by humanity's use of the land and the ocean. At COP16, it is time for all countries to step up and turn a landmark global agreement to protect and restore nature into action. Yes, and uh, of course, there's one problem. Colombia, despite hosting the summit, also failed to meet the deadline. <laughs> oh, God. But all of this stuff about, uh, about saving the oceans and all of that, uh, this is from uh, the Independent Media Institute or Wiki Observatory. I'm not sure which. <coughs> We're going to talk about uh, how humans are going to save the ocean by turning the ocean into the blue economy. Now, you, you, you know, you, you've already grown up in the, like, the diarrhea brown economy that we all know about. And now we've been suffering this unadulterated horseshit greenwashing talking, you know, the bright green lies of the green economy. And more and more, you're going to start hearing the bright blue lies, the blue washing. Now we already have green washing. Now you got to get used to blue washing. The blue economy myth. We have to stop thinking the ocean can be run like a business. So this is the summary. I like how in the 
Independent Media Institute. They do a quick read and a full article read. Since this is a roundup, this is the quick read. The blue economy, you know, is the unadulterated horseshit, well, blue washing. The blue economy refers to the sustainable use, the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, job creation, and environmental preservation. So right off the, uh, right out of the gate, we, Houston, we have a problem. There is no such thing uh, as the sustainable use of an ocean for economic growth and job creation. You cannot have a sustainable use of an ocean or environmental preservation of an ecosystem when you're trying to turn an ecosystem covering 70% of this planet into the newest color of the rainbow economy. Ain't going to happen. It's an oxymoron. It is patently absurd. It is unadulterated horseshit. The oceans are fucked. As global demand for resources grows, more attention is being given to managing the oceans effectively. The blue economy, the blue economy balances industries, balances industries like fishing, aquaculture, shipping, tourism, and renewable energy. Can you say deep sea mining? with the need for marine conservation. So on this side of the ledger, you have fishing, aquaculture, shipping, tourism, and renewable energy, such as deep sea mining on this side of the ledger, and marine conservation on the other. And all right, the United Nations and the European Union are leading efforts to protect ocean ecosystems. Yes. These efforts emphasize the need to sustain marine resources for future generations. However, there are challenges in even defining the term blue economy. While the World Bank sees it as the sustainable use of ocean resources for growth, meaning economic growth and health, the European Commission includes all economic activities linked to oceans. Hmm. But you believe that some view the blue economy horseshit as merely a means for corporations to exploit marine resources. Huh, do you think so? Marine industries such as fishing, mining, and tourism, can you say the cruise ship industry, can harm ocean health contributing to problems like biodiversity loss, pollution, and climate change. Coral reefs, yeah, right, uh, which support half a billion people worldwide are especially vulnerable. Yes. Despite these challenges, the blue economy is crucial for achieving sustainability. The blue economy is crucial for achieving sustainability. I, if that's not a line right out of 1984, I don't know what is. 
export experts warned that if ocean exploitation continues unchecked, the damage could be irreversible, affecting both the environment and the millions who depend on it for survival. I wanted to get the quote from, uh, who was it? it I mean, the, the, the full article is, uh, it is a good Lord, uh, but uh, I, I want to read this short thing on blue washing, blue washing, covering up bad behavior. Terminologies such as green economy and blue economy might seem promising, but are often noted as cover-ups for harmful activities. This is John Childs, uh, one of these uh, fish huggers. I, his, his title is longer than this rant. Uh, quote, the blue economy is not a benign concept offering a win-win for the economy and the environment, said uh, John Childs. Um, co-editor of a special section in the Journal of Political Ecology that presented several papers on the blue economy. Child said uh, the papers he reviewed suggest that the blue economy is, quote, another capitalist fix in which global capital is seeking to reproduce itself to keep making money and create a surplus. This is happening as we get to the point where much of the planet's landmass has been appropriated. Uh, added Nicole Leotold, the executive director of the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, Quote, if greenwashing is the practice of making unsubstantiated or misleading claims about the environmental benefits of an action, then perhaps we need a new term, blue washing, to cover coastal and marine development initiatives which fail to deliver on their environmental and social promises. Personally, I am tired of labels that confuse and mask the development principles we're seeing. Yes, do you think so? So welcome to blue washing. All right, what are we going to dive into next? Uh, I don't know if... And this is ain't going to happen. I just thought uh, it was humorous. Have you seen uh, all of these photos and this, of this drone footage showing destruction left by tornado ripping through Florida solar farm before Hurricane Milton? Uh, I, I remember when Hurricane Maria slammed all of those solar farms in St. Croix fitting a, a solar panel up against a hurricane. Anyway, uh, solar panels in the paths of hurricanes. There you go. Let's talk, uh, you know, I always like to mention uh, some of my heroes from uh, Medium.com. This is Eric Lee's one of his this week, titled The Circular Economy, A Note to the Energy Blind. And, uh, you know, Eric is always, what I, what I like uh, is that he, uh, he, he quotes other people, and, and I'm a little, I don't understand his, sometimes I, even I don't understand Eric's weird sense of humor. So for whatever reason, he is not, he, he okay, I guess he technically does not, uh, 
has not gotten permission to quote this person. So he doesn't use, the, all, all we know is this is a Professor Emeritus or Emeritus. Okay, quoting whoever this person is, uh, talking about how the circular economy is unadulterated horseshit, ain't gonna happen. It's one more of these bullshit solutions that ain't gonna happen. Take it away, professor, whoever you are. In many respects, the circular economy is a mythic construct. Number one, energy is non, energy is non recyclable. 100% goes literally and irreversibly through the production system. Number two, there are also physical limits on material recycling. A, there is always some, often considerable, dissipative loss with each iteration, known as second law inefficiency. B, many materials break down on repeated cycles and have to be replaced. C, there are cost barriers Sometimes it is more economically and ecologically efficient to use new materials. These barriers are among the reasons only something like 10% of plastics and 50% of paper are recycled in North America. And number three, the biggest problem, however, is economic growth. Even with a theore theoretically impossible 100% recycling of everything, if the economy is growing, we would need twice as much of everything after just 35 years at a 2% annual real growth in consumption. And then as Eric notes, a mere 2% rate of economic growth is also known as an economic recession. Negative growth is not believed in, though it is a condition that will come anyway, so that's going to happen, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, not because of any bullshit circular economy. And, and I even used to fall for this shit. You know, Herman Daly, all his big talks, bullshit, unadulterated horseshit, ain't going to happen, physically impossible, even if there was any political will for it. Um, uh, let's see, from Eric Lee to Eric Michaels, uh, titled More Bargaining in Hopium. I, I love Eric Michaels calling the, the, uh, apocalyptimist hopium peddler Johan Rockstrom out. You go, Eric, this is Eric talking about uh, uh, about uh, Johan, among other things. Uh, there are millions out there who use reductionist thinking and think that political, that political solutions or sustainable solutions or renewable solutions or green solutions and now blue solutions will somehow mitigate the predicaments we face. I listened to this interview with Johan Rockstrom that Nate Hagens did and I was really depressed by the constant stream of hopium. He, meaning Rockstrom and probably uh, Nate Hagens as well, he believes in techno 
logical solutions mm -hmm. and sadly demonstrates the incorrect thinking that a large part of society incorporates into their own thinking patterns. Of course, he, meaning Johann Rockström, is in denial that what we face is a predicament with an outcome rather than a problem with a solution. His denial of the facts does not change those facts in making recommendations that will lead society in the wrong direction is precisely what Nate Hagens has repeatedly talked about with other scientists. I'm disappointed that Nate didn't call him out on the spot, although he did brush Johan off about carbon capture technology. The fact that so many scientists think uncritically about industry marketing and don't appear to realize that technology cannot solve predicaments lead me, leads me to realize just how uncritical most of society is regardless of what one's day job is. Being that civilization itself is unsustainable so that trying to maintain it is both impossible and accomplishes nothing just adds to the humor of the podcast. Talk of energy transitions or other transitions is also ridiculous. I can appreciate the message that Johan brings to the table without embracing his solutions, which amount to complete garbage. Yes. So it is with interest that I watch Johan express his anxiety and desperation. His approach sounds reasonable until one does the research on all the technology he, discuss, he discusses and discovers that none of it can do what he thinks it can. He's simply bargaining to maintain civilization. Much of this type of nonsense will cease to be an issue as society begins understanding that conditions cannot go backwards to a grander, nicer time in history. I can say that a less complex society might be possible where people actually do enjoy it more than what we have today, but the ongoing collapse that surrounds us will keep most from being able to appreciate it for any length of time. I think that things will never be better than they are right now. And, uh, you know, I have heard this one uh, many times. As bad as you think it is today, this is as good as it's ever going to be from here on out, guys. Today is better than tomorrow. Tomorrow is better than Sunday. You say, well, you know, today is the best day of the rest of your life because every day we're more fucked than the day before. So get used to getting out there and enjoying today while you still can. Uh, I don't know who this clueless fucking moron showing up on a... Uh, on, uh, medium.com is uh, asking the question. I love it when they ask a question. Can we build more houses and restore nature? Uh, despite agreements, yeah, agreements to protect 30% of land for nature by 2030, the latest calculations show the opposite. Ain't gonna happen. So Tim is wondering, 
can house building can house building turn from problem to solution? The answer to can we build more houses and restore nature? And the question can house building turn from problem to solution is no. It ain't going to happen that we're going to save 30% of this planet for all of our fellow earthlings by building more houses for humans. <sighs> I want to end on that one. Uh, two more. This one right here today from goodoldmedium.com from Michael Barnard. Cement demand will plummet in coming decades and with it emissions. Yes. We have solutions in hand that will address the problem of cement over the coming decades and uh, good God if you like charts and graphs uh, anyway I'm not uh, basically what he's talking about is uh, and, and, and I've heard this and, and I and I don't 100 uh, percent reject this part of his argument is that China, uh, it, it, it is about built out. I mean, it's still, I think what he said, maybe 17 more years, but, but China, uh, I, I think, I'm sure he has to figure somewhere in this book linked article, you know, that China has put more cement on this planet in like the last 20 years than the United States has ever done in, in the last 200 years. Uh, and now that China is pretty much cemented over, uh, and they're the, you know, when China stops using cement, according to this, to this jackass, that nobody else will use cement. And uh, will cement, uh, the use of cement plummet? I don't know what his definition of plummet by the year 2100 is. It is safe to say, I do agree, that the use of cement on planet Earth will plummet by the year 2100. So maybe that is going to happen. But you know what I'm talking about. It's not going to happen because humans are going to voluntarily uh, limit the use of cement, and the other side of the, equa the equation, uh, even if the use of cement were to plummet uh, over the next couple of decades like he's claiming, it's not going to make a, dot, a goddamn difference to, uh, to greenhouse gas emissions. Ain't, ain't, ain't going to happen. The reducing cement uh, greenhouse gas emissions are going right on up, 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 with or without cement. All right, let's do two more here. Back to the Independent Media Institute. Guide to climate action in your own local community. All right. Yes. This is how. Uh, in, 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 in anyway. Uh, understanding how you know local government policies to save the planet are made can help you get involved in decisions that shape your community. You can focus on areas like master plans, zoning, and local ordinances which guide decisions about resources. By working together, 
you and your local allies can push for policies that promote climate resilience, create local jobs, and support housing for all. Yes, I guess that's part of uh, saving the planet by building more houses. Oh, shut up. But anyway, we're going to uh, hear from the native savages from uh, this outfit called Local Futures, titled, It Is Not the End. It is not the end. We have several possible futures. Here is an interview with indigenous one more time, there is no such thing as an indigenous American. With indigenous author, the noble savage, Ailton, A-I-L-T-O, Krenak. I have no uh, clue whether this person is, uh, is uh, male or female. Oh, this is a manga bay. Uh, interview with a noble savage. You know, it used to be that Friday was my Manga Bay Roundup. Uh, I traded in my Manga Bay Roundup, uh, you know, at the first of the year for my Ain't Gonna Happen. So we're going to close with uh, an Ain't Gonna Happen interview with a noble savage from Manga Bay. For decades, scientists have been warning that the world is heading toward catastrophic scenarios due to climate change. But Ailton Krenak refuses to think about an apocalypse. Yes, on the contrary, he, well it is a he, he argues that there are several possible futures but they will only be achievable when we realize that, quote, being is more important than having, which right there is the reason it ain't going to happen because any of these uh, non-apocalyptic uh, futures are dependent uh, on, uh, uh, on the majority of the world realizing that, quote, being is more important than having. For the Brazilian indigenous leader, once again, unless he is a monkey with a prehensile tail, he is not a Bra an indigenous Brazilian. There is no such thing as an indigenous Brazilian. Okay? Ain't gonna happen. Well, as I say, unless he has a prehensile tail. Uh, for the Brazilian indigenous leader, environmentalist, philosopher, poet, and writer, Western society is facing an urgent need for a paradigm shift that challenges the ideas of progress and development themselves. Okay. Quote, I am not a pessimist, but I am sure that the only way to move forward in this world is to reconnect with ancient wisdom. We have long been divorced from this living organism that is the earth. There you go. So as soon as as the world reconnects with ancient wisdom, we can save the planet. Yeah. Krenak has a deeply skeptical view of capitalist progress and argues it devalues the natural world. Huh. He says he believes humanity is facing an urgent need to reconnect with the biocentric approach that dethrones humanity 
from its pedestal and roots us back to our origins. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, whatever. All right, we're going to close with some key ideas. Uh, Kreenak advocates for a paradigm shift away from modern Western notions of progress, development, and unrestrained economic growth that are the root causes of global challenges like climate change and biodiversity loss. He says he believes we can change course and that several possible sustainable futures exist if humanity would just reconnect with ancient wisdom and recognize Earth as a living organism and lives in harmony with nature. Uh, I noticed that uh, in this book from a fellow I hope to be interviewing here in a couple of weeks at Collapse Chronicles, Dan Dorison, addicted to BS. Addicted to BS, I notice, and I want to ask Dan about this, the Gaia theory of, uh, you know, James Lovelock and this uh, non-indigenous Asian invader into the Amazon. Uh, uh, According to uh, Dan, biologist Dan Dorison, the Gaia hypothesis, unadulterated horseshit. I, uh, I'm interested to find out more, but we will be hearing from Dan, I hope, in a couple of weeks as I actually try to interview somebody on Collapse Chronicles. But anyway, i got to wrap this up because I think Sandy is coming on with her show at Environmental Coffee House here shortly. and uh, So I'm going to wrap this up and uh, freshen my drink, make a bowl of popcorn, and see what's on Sandy's mind while I enjoy this frosty evening with my uh, planet-eating heater while I still can. Let's see how Sancho Panza is. Uh... So, Sancho, what do you think? You say, Pop, there's a fly. I got a bug on me like that. Do you have the bug on you or what? You say, Pop, there's a bug in here. There's a bug in my bed. Well, it's probably a tick. I got to go through and pick the ticks off of my dog. Get that bug right up. Get the bug. You need to get that bug like that. That bug. Get the bug. You need to get that bug. Get that bug like that, Sancho. Good Lord, it's 43 minutes. I need to stop talking to myself and get a fresh drink. My God.